Good morning. It's Wednesday, April 8th, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 155. My name is Chris, and it's here. Well, part one of an ongoing saga. The Apple Watch reviews have hit the web today, and uh, we just spent a whole bunch of time breaking it all down. And we're going to give you sort of a quick meta overview of it. We won't spend a lot of time, because if you're all that interested, you can go read the reviews yourself. But to help me break down some of that stuff is our Mumble Room. Time-appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Good day. Time appropriate Hello. greetings. Hey guys, how are you? I missed your faces. I feel like it's been uh, a whole day since we've talked, and I just don't know how I get by without you. You ready to get through the news? Yep. So let's start with on the so on the uh, we had a good pre-show today, and we were talking about uh, the Apple Watch and Android Wear. Well, today a lot of the uh, embargo well the embargo has been lifted. A lot of the reviews are hitting the web. And so I'll give you sort of some meta coverage of the Apple Watch, the next big thing from Apple. Uh, in, in one sentence, it's the best smartwatch ever made, but it's not for everyone. Uh, to sort of uh, whittle it down a little more, Bloomberg writes, uh, Joshua Topolsky, actually writing for Bloomberg, wrote, The watch is not life-changing. It is, however, excellent. Apple will sell millions of these devices, and many people will love and obsess over them. It's a wonderful component of a big ecosystem that the company has carefully built over many years. It's more seamless and simple than any of its counterparts in the marketplace. It is, without question, the best smartwatch in the world. Um... Yeah, well, yeah, for $600 on average, I should expect so. Here's The Verge's video on it. Let's see what they had to say. Oh, boy. It's the Apple Watch. Uh, Oh, boy. There's so much to say about the Apple Watch. It's Apple's first new product in five years, and it's the first one developed after Steve Jobs died. There's a lot riding on this thing. Apple introduced it at a celebrity-filled event last year so huge they built an entire temporary building for it. You can spend anywhere from $350 to $17,000 on it. It's crazy. It's a big deal. So what's it like? First, the Apple Watch doesn't look anything like Apple's other products. It's rounder and friendlier than the iPhone or the MacBook. It really looks more like a first-generation iPhone than anything else. It's also pretty heavy, it's just under three ounces, and it feels like one solid object in your hand. It's just way nicer than any other smartwatch out there. It also has more stuff. Unlike Google's Android Wear, which basically extends your phone, the Apple Watch feels like an entire little computer on your wrist, and that's both good and bad. Unlike every other smartwatch, the Apple Watch is all about physical controls. It literally has buttons and knobs, and it takes a while to figure them all out. There's the digital crown scroll wheel, which is also a button, the screen itself, which uses a new technology called force touch to act as another button, and there's a side button, which is especially confusing since it looks just like the iPhone sleep button, but actually opens the communications app. Apple's making a big deal out of the digital crown, which lets you smoothly scroll and zoom on the watch without your fingers getting in the way of the screen. And it's definitely nice to have. After using the watch for a while, I looked for the crown on my phone. But you can also just scroll through lists on the watch just fine with your finger. And in general, anything you can do with the crown, you can do on the screen. The back of the watch has a raised area for the optical heart rate sensor, and it's also where the magnetic charging cable connects. The cable is nice, but I wish Apple had included a nice dock, like Motorola does with the Moto 360. Of course, all of the real action with the Apple Watch happens on the screen, and the Retina display is beautiful. It has super bright colors, great viewing angles, and inky blacks that make it seem like it blends right into the sides of the watch. It's great. My only complaint is that it's not laminated super close to the watch face. There's definitely a small air gap that you can see from time to time. Once you start using the watch, it's pretty obvious that there's actually three different things going on. The first and most important is that the watch face is an entire little smartwatch platform all by itself. It's where you're gonna spend the most time. There's really only a few basic templates, but you can customize the details on almost all of them. There's not really a great digital watch face though and you can't create your own or buy new ones like you can with Android Wear. It's a missed opportunity, and Apple has to be working on it. But the watch face is really about two things, notifications and glances. When you get a notification, you'll feel a slight tap on your wrist, but the screen won't light up. When you actually look at your wrist, the watch will first show you what kind of notification you've got, and if you keep looking, it'll show you the actual information that came in. This is great if you get a lot of notifications, and you're almost certainly gonna get a lot of notifications because the iPhone app that controls everything comes set to full blast by default. So we're really looking forward to launching this new thing. We're thinking a lot about the future. We wanna bring in food and technology and kind of think about 
how we can you know, spin that into a really great package. And we were wondering if The Verge was interested in collaborating with us. So this is an email from a coworker who is not this coworker. Uh, I don't have time to answer this right now because I want to pay attention, so I'm just going to dismiss it for later. So we thought that you know this was something that could be a really great collaboration for the Eater and The Verge, and we were wondering if you guys had any thoughts on it. Yeah, there's so much. This is an Instagram like. And here's the real problem with the Apple Watch right now. The settings for how you control what notifications go from your phone to your watch aren't very granular. It's kind of all or nothing for every app you have on your phone. So I'm getting all kinds of notifications I don't want. And to turn them off, I have to go through a huge list and pick which one's yes or no. And so really, all I'm doing is knowing more about what's happening on my phone than ever before. Is there somewhere that you need to be right now? No, no, no. I really want to talk about this. I think it's such an exciting project. There's so much we could do together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another thing that we're thinking about is the modern kitchen. This is another text from my wife. So now I'm not paying attention to Sonia. I'm not paying attention to my friends and family. But I'm more aware of how many people that I'm ignoring than ever before. I'm not sure that I like it. If you miss a notification, you can just go back to the list from the watch face and take it from there. But you'll sometimes notice that notifications slow things down, which is a theme on the watch. It's a little underpowered. It's the same with glances, which are basically little status screens you can open from the watch face. You can quickly check your heart rate or figure out your location or look at the weather. Apps on your phone can install glances, so I can see what the top trends on Twitter are or look at mass transit options using transit. It's cool, but glances don't update in the background, so you have to wait for them to load from your phone. And I'm going to leave it right there because I think the glances thing is an interesting feature, but uh, I'll let the uh, remainder of the review at The Verge. But I thought that was probably uh, the, the, uh, the, the bar scene there. It was exactly the scenario you're going to find yourself in. As somebody who's been walking around with Android Wear, it's a, two, it's a double-edged sword. One is... Um, I can more quickly uh, check in and see if it's something I need to j jump on right away or not. And I can attempt to do a reply using voice dictation. Uh, and so a lot of times it, I like it because it takes away the mystery of why did my phone just vibrate or why is my notification light going off? But at the same time, it also means um, I get a lot more distractions. So it's it, you really have to work, work with that part closely. It looks like it's ex the watch is extremely well built. Uh, Mumble, did you guys have any comments or thoughts after watching that uh, review? I like where she chimes in and saying, are you paying attention? Yeah, <laughs> she totally calls him out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. So the uh, the watch goes av available for pre-order on April 10th at 12.01 Pacific time. And then uh, I believe it should be shipping on the 24th. And the in-store pickup situation is looking pretty rough. You know, uh, I think, in my opinion, this is maybe one to sit out. But uh, if you're super hardcore about this stuff, go for it. Go for it. Uh, hey, I have a little update. Let's talk about Android for a little bit. Uh, so thanks uh, to the uh, uh, fine user who submitted this to the subreddit. I'm sorry I, I spaced on your name. Uh, but uh, you submitted a stop Android lollipop from killing your battery. And it's an article over on Tech Republic about things you can do to help save battery life. And uh, if you've been following the show daily, you know that I've been struggling with battery life really, 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 really bad on my Nexus 5. In fact, to the point where battery was like maybe two hours at best. And everywhere I was going, I was needing to charge. And so I was really struggling, uh, getting to the point where it was starting to become, you know, a, a serious issue. And so uh, Rikai says to me, he says, hey, have you checked out Greenify? I'm like, what? Yeah, it's green something, he says. Green, Greenify, something like that. I'm like, oh, another one of these task management applications for Android. Womp, womp. Well, I was desperate. I mean, I was real desperate. So I went over to Google Play Store and I looked for Greenify and by golly, it is legit. Uh, and what it essentially does is it can't necessarily, it doesn't give you like this app is taking this much battery. This app is taking this much battery. Instead, it sort of breaks it down differently. It says these applications in the background will not automatically hibernate, i.e. they are not allowing the operating system to suspend them. These applications are waking up every time you unlock your screen. These applications are waking up every time you change networks. Well, guess what? Turns out I had quite a few applications that were doing a little bit of this, of each. Um, a surprising one was, uh, I didn't realize this, but the Amazon app. If you have Amazon.com's app on your phone, it wakes up every time you change Wi-Fi networks. I did not know that. I don't know why it does that. Maybe it's for package delivery. Maybe not. So using Greenify, I can go in there and say, no, 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 no. No. No, you can suspend these. I'll give you another example. I have two Twitter apps, Plume and uh, Talon. And I don't really use one very much. I just kind of have talent to play with it. And Plume is my primary Twitter client right now. Well, guess what? They're both running and neither one of them wanted to hibernate. So now with Greenify, when they said, <laughs> you can hibernate um, 
Talon. I do not use it that often. I will just manually update it when I need to. So that, uh, and a lot of things run in the background. If this, then that. I mean, so you be so many apps get really greedy on Android really fast. So Greenify, which was free, let me go in there and do this, and you can get more. And there's like there's a paste you can pay to get other stuff as well. Uh, it's a donation. And, um, I don't even know. You, you, you know, you unlock some 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 fancy ass features when you pay. Like you get something, you get something fancy. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't honestly remember. It's like some more advanced hibernation app management. And I, maybe one day I'll need that. But right now I haven't needed that. And uh, so um, by the end of by the end of the workday, so about four or five o'clock, my Nexus Five was at sixty five percent battery. Nice. Yeah, and that was after going from only being able to last for two hours. You guys. How about what features does it give you based on being rooted or not being rooted? There is a whole new set of features you get based on being rooted. It's like way cooler when you're when you're rooted, and I don't know exactly what that is. Uh, I know it gives you more data on the power apps are using, but I think it also gives you other more fancy features. Um, let's see, I'm looking to see if they actually just say on the uh, page here. Uh, you get other uh, interesting. Oh, you get to see what what woke up different hibernated apps. Okay. Um, so for non-root devices, you can disable screen lock and bind accessibility servers. I'm not sure exactly, but there are some advantages. Uh, and I felt like, um, oh, okay. Okay. So it has some features to integrate with some backup programs as well. And uh, different v different features depending on what version of Android you have. So like if you have Android 4.1+, uh, even in not root mode, it can automate the hibernation after screen. So you can have it say uh, hibernate apps when your screen's off. So unhibernate the apps when your when your screen's awake. So maybe you're using your phone and you want that stuff in the background to be active. But when your screen's off, you could have a class of applications that it auto hibernates regardless. Pretty neat. Let's greenify. I have a link in the show notes. Uh, did you want to say something, uh, Tuck? Or who's who is wants to say Tuck? Did you want to say something? TC? Say? Tuck. Okay. TC or whatever. <laughs> okay, TC. I'll try to remember that. It looks like yeah. Tuck. So at least I'm not calling you Tuck's the, bite, the butt wipes. All right. So what did, oh, yeah. what did you want to add? No, I was just adding that I've, I just downloaded it. I've been using it for a while, but I just forgot to yeah. load it after I uh, flashed my new ROM. And it's just awesome. And I was looking through and it says on uh, like spot uh, one is like greenify, uh, battery leaching memory hogs to hibernate them. Two, enjoy. And then three, only if you have root, it's housekeeping. I guess it's so greenify will do stuff for you like automatically. Yeah, that's really nice, huh? Uh, I love this. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, as long as there's a web browser on iOS, you can't lock it down too much. Popcorn time for iOS works brilliantly. Uh, it's working now. The torrent streaming popcorn time application is working for iOS devices. Hey, oh, non jailbroken apps, too. Uh, non jailbroken devices, I think, because I think it's a web based app, but I'm not positive. Uh, it's pretty popcorn time lives on, you guys. And now <laughs> you can airplay uh, popcorn time apps to your Apple TV. Take that movie industry. Don't pirate movies. All right, and then just a quick follow-up. Uh, Heartbleed, one year later, it was on April 7th, 2014, so yesterday, that CVE 2014-0160 came out. Oh, yeah, rolls off the tongue. That's the TLS Heartbleed Read Overrun, a.k.a. Heartbleed. Uh, it was first publicly disclosed on April 7th last year. Uh, but to many, it was just simply known as Heartbleed. A new report from the certificate vendor, Vanafi, claims that 76% of organizations are still at risk, though that statistic uh, is maybe, you know, well, it's a statistic, so you take that at, at for what it is. 76% is a pretty big one. It could just be people that have parked domains and things like that as well. Uh, they say, uh, of course, another one, uh, Qualysys, SSL Pulse, they say that only 0.3% of sites are still at risk. So you have a range between one vendor who says 76% of sites are still at risk to Heartbleed and another vendor who says that only 0.3% of sites are at risk. So whatever the risk is today, it, it probably lives on. I mean, let's all be honest, people don't patch and there's a lot of old machines out there. But I just, uh, can you guys believe it's been a year? I, that to me, that was the big story that I took away from this. I freaking year since Heartbleed, it honestly doesn't seem that long ago. It seems more like six months maybe. Yeah, I still find sites occasionally that still have it, and having the extension in like Firefox or whatever browser helps yeah. you know be able to find those. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Hey, guess what? Uh, the Linux Action Show, Linux Fest Northwest, support our trip to Linux Fest Northwest. Make yourself look even better with swag. Campaign relaunch. Teespring.com slash Linux. It's got four days left. If you want to grab one, there'll be one more batch, and then I think it's probably going to be done. We got a T-shirt, kids' tea. The hoodie, which is awesome if you're somewhere where it's a little cold right now. The long sleeve shirts, which I love. And the ladies tee. And the long sleeve shirts have a nice red and black. And if you check out the t-shirt, look at this blue. Love that blue. I got uh, my first picture 
trifecta. Let me go here over to the let me go over here to the Twitters, you guys, because uh, I think I got sent in. I think my first tweet. If you get a picture and you want to tweet me, uh, I love that stuff. Yeah, here he is. Here he is. <laughs> we'll check it out. Look at that. The kid and himself right there wearing the Linux Action Show shirt. That's uh, Eric on Twitter, at Eric W-A-S. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, Eric, for sending that in. You guys look good, too. That's awesome. They're both wearing slacks, too. <laughs> or uh, uh, t- uh, khakis. So uh, teespring.com slash Linux. If you want to go grab yourself one, I think that's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, all right, don't forget you can join us throughout the week. I'll be here tomorrow. It's uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, over at jblive.tv. Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. That's where you go to get that in your local time zone. If you want to make the show better throughout the week, techtalktoday.reddit.com. I'm looking for Kickstarters, end of show clip video thingies that you want to have us play. It's always super appreciated. And uh, if you end up uh, ordering a watch, let us know how it goes. Send it into the show today at jupiterbroadcasting.com. So I'll be back here tomorrow and Friday. Hope you'll join us then. It's going to be an interesting week with uh, the watch pre-orders just around the corner. So you know me. I can't help it. I love playing these old watch commercials, Uh, especially in comparison to the watch commercials we're going to be inundated with as more and more people create their wearables. It's pretty fun to look back at how we used to market this fad as it came back in. And it comes and it goes and it comes and goes and it comes. So the last time this was around, this was our this was our effort. I'll leave you at that. Goodbye, everybody. See you back here tomorrow with this uh, train wreck. Tag Heuer. 150 years ago, in a workshop in Switzerland, a perfect watch was born. Time passed. Tools changed. Year after year, Tag Heuer watchmakers have pioneered precision. Tag Heuer watches became a legend. Tag Heuer. What are you made of?